keynote today. So please join me in welcoming him. Merci Florian. Désolé, tout le monde, je ne parle pas français, donc je peux parler en anglais. I'm sorry, I can do no other. Um, so, um, I, it's difficult to live up to that uh, introduction, but I will try. So, this time last year, uh, we were looking at uh, 10 years of celebration, 10 years of RDF since the, not the very first specs on which the Semantic Web is based were published, but the the ones that most of us got to know very well, they were finalized in 2004. And so this time last year, we were able to look back and have a look at the various different activities there are around that make use of the technology. And last year, this year, all the previous occasions, all the different events that you go to, you will see and hear about and be involved with a number of different activities that prove the value of the technology. So um, we don't need to rehearse that again, but that was uh, the subject last year. So here we are today, and what has changed in the last year? Well, W3C, the, for those unfamiliar, the standards body for the web, led by Tim Berners-Lee, the web inventor, um, is not known for being quick. We take a while to do things. In fact, we are criticized for many things, and one of the things that we get criticized for a great deal is how long it takes for a standard to be completed. Uh, sorry, uh, it does take a long time. And it takes a long time because we have to get it right. Because the web is a multi-billion dollar industry, it's part of the infrastructure, it's part of the fabric of now the way the world works, and we have to get it right and we have to test that it works, and that takes time. And you also have to be sure that when you build your business using the platform, that you are not going to suddenly find a year down the line that you have used someone's patent or somebody's copyright and they suddenly uh, demand that you pay them lots of money. All those things are important and that's why it takes time. In the last year, the only um, standard that I think has been completed is a thing called Link Data Platform, then it was played with LDP, Link Data Platform, which is a way of passing triples to and from without using Sparkle. It's designed for, to be useful in, in building applications, particularly social media applications and that kind of thing. It allows you to shift triples around just using HTTP verbs. That's the only one that's been uh, completed in the last year. Um, but there's a lot of work ongoing at the moment which we can uh, have a look at. Here's one. You may potentially have seen this. It's called Shackle, Shapes and Constraint Language. One of the things about the semantic web technology and the linked data technologies that we work with in this community is that it follows the open world assumption, meaning that no matter what you say, somebody else can say something else, and because you know X and Y, you cannot find out. You don't, you don't know what the value of Z might be. It's, it's open world, and you only know as much as you know. In some situations, that's a problem. You want to be able to validate the data you've got. You want to be sure that what you've got matches a certain schema. Um, so we needed to create the equivalent in RDF of XML schema. So that's what the Shackle Working Group um, is trying to do. Actually, formerly the Working Group is called the RDF Shapes Working Group. And there was a recent, recently published first draft of the standard that's working towards that. There's a slight problem with it, though, which we must admit in public which is that there's another way of doing the same thing, which is called shape expressions. These are two competing ways of doing the same thing. And both those competing methods of doing the same thing, of closing the world, of validating RDF against a particular schema, so that if I send you some data, you can check that I have used the right properties, I've given the right values for the properties, and so on. In order to be able to check that, um, so there are two different ways of doing it, and they don't agree. And there are some fundamental differences within that working group, and trying to bring those two together is proving quite difficult. The only way we're going to solve that, the only way that we can move forward, the only way that we, W3C, can offer the world a way to validate RDF and validate semantic web technology that doesn't use OWL, um, is to get more use cases. Now, this is designed to do a number of things. It's designed so I can send you data and you can check that it, it matches your expectations. It's also designed to help you build Sparkle query editors. If you know the shape of the graph you're going to be querying, that helps you decide what the query has to look like. So that's one of the use cases for that as well. 
Another use case is developing your user interface so that when somebody is creating some RDF data, you can again provide a user interface that makes it easy and provides drop-down boxes of allowed values and so on. All those are the use cases for this one working group, the RDF Data Shares Working Group, and they have this, this OMPAS, to use the English word. Um, how do you put these two things together? Uh, and what we need, please, is feedback, and we need use cases, and we need test data. Otherwise, that group uh, may not get much further. Just uh, yesterday, uh, one of the working groups that started at the end of 2013 has just completed its work. Um, it's called CSV on the web. Most data out there is either geospatial or it's tabular. Um, so a lot of that data that's shared is, is in some sort of CSV file or a, um, um, a, a relational database dump. How do you describe that in such a way that you can convert it to other things? How do you understand the column headings, the data types, the annotations, and so on? So CSV on the web, we've, we've done that now. We have implementations for it. Um, we could do more implementations. I mean, CSV, it's, it's, it's ready, but you know, what else do we need to do? If you work with tabular data, if you bring in data from lots of different places, you're probably going to get an export from an Excel spreadsheet. How do you handle that? CSV on the web has a set of standards to help you do that, to provide that metadata, to automatically translate it to JSON or RDF or anything else you may want to do with it. Groups I'm particularly involved with personally, there's one called Data on the Web Best Practices. That was floundering, it was struggling for a while. The problem with trying to come up with advice on how to share data on the web is, the, is that the topic is huge. There are so many things you could say. And it's really hard, it was very hard, to work out exactly what it is that group is trying to do. We know in theory, in theory we want to make a better ecosystem for data sharing. We want to make it easier for people to pick up your data and know what to expect, we want fewer surprises. That's okay, but how do you actually codify that into a set of individual statements that you can follow? That work has been, a year ago, it was in trouble. Now it's on track and we have got a document that uh, should be republished again very soon that has some concrete evidence in it, some very good advice. So that's coming from our W3C data on the web best practices working group. Alongside that I run a big project called SharePSI, uh, which is a network of 40 partners from around uh, the EU um, and that is developing policy side, the, 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 the policy side of open data and data sharing um, we have a final workshop on that uh, in a couple of weeks in Berlin, looking at interoperability, control of vocabularies, and geospatial. So there's a, a mixture of technical and policy going on there. The end result is a, a, a combined set of best practices to help encourage uh, data sharing in different ways, particularly from the public sector. Part of that work also um, is trying to provide more information about data sets. So, we have a couple of vocabularies that we're developing. We wanted one that was able to help describe the quality of a data set. Is this any good for the purpose you have? Well, I don't know about you, but it's, we find it really hard to define what quality means. And all we can do is say that the quality of this data set depends on what you want to do with it, but here are the features, and if that matches what you want, well, then it's good quality. But if you want to do something else with it, then it won't be good quality for you. Those are essentially annotations, they're extra bits of information. So the quality is, is largely annotations, there's some other, one or two metrics you can put on. You can put a certificate on it and say, this data has been through some sort of certified process, you can do that. But you, so <coughs> the real quality of the data is down to you as the user to decide. The other vocabulary is about usage. If I use your data, you should be thanked. You should be aware that I use your data. I should be able to tell you that I used it for something exciting. You should feel good about the fact that I've used your data, I hope. So again, that's more annotations. How do we <clears throat> annotate data to say that something's been used? How do I say thank you for that? And all that also fits in with yet another working group looking at web annotations as well. So those, those things are uh, on track. They should be uh, completed. All the data on the web best practices and the shared PSI stuff should be done by the summer of next year. That's when the charter runs out. I'm going to spend most of my time today talking about one group in particular that started uh, in January. Um, 
March 2014, so I probably mentioned this last year, um, March 2014, I ran a workshop with a bunch of other people around geospatial <coughs> data. If you've done any work with maps and spatial data, then you will come across our sister standards body, the Open Geospatial Consortium, the OGC. The OGC has a whole range of standards that are, of course, very <laughs> widely used. They're very well written. They do some fantastic stuff. If you ever look at a map online, if you use a mapping service, or whatever it may be, OGC is a standards body behind that. <coughs> but they have certain assumptions about the world. I don't mean the world that it's round and it's not flat and so on. They have assumptions about the way you work. It's based very heavily on XML. Um, and it's based on the idea of web services, not capital W, capital S web services, but APIs and so on. That's what the spatial data community understands, and they exchange GML or perhaps GeoJSON. What that community doesn't do is use the web. <coughs> Although most of their standards have the word web in it somewhere, web feature service, web map service, web catalog service. In fact, they don't use the web in the way that we understand it. So that one of the things that we, we want to try and get them to do, and we're working with the OGC in this working group, it's a joint working group between the OGC and W3C. We want the geospatial community to make better use of web technology. And by the same token, they, the geospatial community, want to make better use of the web. So one of the ways that we mean, one of the, 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 the concrete examples of that is um, if you have a lookup service for what they call a feature, a feature is anything you can point to. Usually, and it, it will either be a point, a line, or a polygon on a map. That's, that's the OGC definition of a feature. It can be a, a city, it can be anything. It can be a flower in, in, the, in the garden. But those things are, are described in web feature services, which is an API, and it's a closed API. In other words, you have to query it repeatedly to get the information out, and the search engine can't crawl that data. It's not linked data. You can't find out what's in the catalog or what's in the web feature index without querying it all the time. So we want them to open it up. They want to open it up. How do we take this, this, this database and turn it into a set of web pages in the way that this community understands. For every web feature, there should be a web, there should be a web page which is crawlable, indexable, that's got the information in it with a stable URI so you can point to it and so on. It's basic linked data stuff, but in the very advanced and very skillful geospatial community, it's news and they need that. They, they need that help. Some people, I should say, need help to get that sorted out. So that's one of the things the geospatial group is doing. <coughs> So again, joint, so the, the standards coming out of that are both W3C standards and OGC standards. The other thing we're looking at there, which came up um, the meeting last week actually, we had a face-to-face -face meeting, the big W3C get together in Japan. I'm just about over the jet lag. Um, is the idea of link sets. Now, um, when you're talking about interoperability and different people sharing things, People like their own terms, people like their own vocabularies, they like their own way of doing things, some of which they will have invented last week. In some cases, those terms, those ideas will have been invented centuries ago. If you're talking about government data, sometimes those terms come from you know, medieval times. <clears throat> How do you link those two things together? Well, there are lots of ways of doing that. It's not hard. SCOS is designed to help you do that. You can link one thing to another, you can use our same as, you can use our equivalent class, equivalent property. There are lots of existing ways of saying, when I say rouge and you mean red, that's okay, it's the same thing. But is there a, a better way of sharing that information? So I've done this mapping, how can I share that mapping with you? What's the best way of me sharing my mapping with you? So you might want to use my mapping or pick it up and do something else with it. So there might be a note coming out from both the Data on the Web Best Practices group and the Spatial Data Working Group on link sets. Like all these things, what we need though is help. We need people to actually do it. I don't write the specs. My job is to get people together who then write the specs. W3C doesn't write specs. We get the group together and it's the group that writes the specs. Um, something else that again the special data on the web working group is looking at, uh, which I will come on to. Okay, so <coughs> links is one thing. Um, they're looking at, um, if, you've done the, if you've come across the OWL time ontology, that was a, 
uh, a draft in 2006, September 2006. This working group is going to finish that off. Uh, if you've done any work on Internet of Things, you may have come across the Semantic Sensor Network vocabulary. Semantic Sensor Network was developed in one of our incubator groups. We're turning that into a standard. And there's a new thing we're doing as well, which if you're a geospatial person, you will know what the word coverage is, means. If you're not a geospatial person, my guess is you don't know what the word coverage means. It means a grid. You have a gridded data, and for each of those cells, you have a particular value. So what's the value of this square? What's the value of that square? And so on. Now, in RDF, you probably <coughs> describe that using the RDF data cube, which is a vocabulary that allows you to do that, to put statistics on a map or, on that, or whatever it may be. Um, there are a few problems with that. Um, but let's look at the, the good stuff, first of all. If you have that kind of coverage, another word, another an application of the general idea of coverage is satellite imagery. So a satellite returns individual spectrum um, what exactly is the color of the light coming back from each of those grid squares. So these are coverages, these are grid squares from a satellite image that tells you exactly what the crop is growing there. So you can find out where the maize is, where is the wheat, where is the hemp being grown, where are all the opium crops in Afghanistan, where are the um, farmers who are claiming that they're growing maize when in fact they're growing something else, that kind of thing. Yeah. There are all sorts of applications for satellite data, and the satellite industry are obviously very keen to share their data and get people to use it. So coverages in linked data is, a, is an important use case that, again, this joint OGC W3C working group is, uh, is working on. It's a very exciting group. It's getting a lot of attention both within W3C and in OGC. If you have any interest in geospatial information at all, that might be an interesting uh, group to, to join. The problem with satellite data and coverage data in general is it so damn big? And that's the problem with using the RDF data cube. RDF data cube is it's an RDF vocabulary and it's extremely good at telling you how to individually, how to express these, uh, a, a grid of information using triples. The problem is the triples become extremely voluminous. There are you know, millions and billions of triples describing what you can show in a, a, a picture quite easily. So an issue that comes out of the geospatial world that we need to tackle, and that group is tackling it, is how do you address a subset? I don't want the whole whale, I just want the fin. I just want this bit of data. So if you have temperature records, your temperature records for the whole of France since the first temperature record. How do you actually, what I really want is temperature records for this particular arrondissement for the last 10 years. Or I want today's temperature. You only want a specific value. You only want a little bit of it. How do you do that subsetting? Um, again, people have lots of different solutions for that, but we want to try and give people a, a steer on, 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 on how to do that. We think one possible way of doing that is to um, pick up uh, Open Search. You may have come across Open Search. It's a little tiny standard, not one of ours, that um, if you look in your web browser, you have a choice of search engines, and you can decide whether you want to use Google or Bing or Yandex, or whatever it may be. That works because the query that goes from your browser to the search engine is standardized. It's called Open Search. It's um, question mark, uh, Q equals, and then there's, the, then there's the text. That's a standardized thing. That, now, the important point about that is it doesn't depend on the technology at the end of the line. It's just a, a way of writing the URL, if you like, that, that uh, triggers the, the search. OGC, the Open Geospatial Consortium, defined an extension to that. So you could say, I want to search in there, but I only want to search within this boundary box or within this particular area, within this particular time and get back results from that. We think that's the beginnings of a way of doing this. So I think when we talk about making a subset of a data set, it'll be a query, but it will be a very simple syntax that you would then have to interpret <coughs> in your actual query engine. And again, that would give you a nice stable URI that, yes, it includes a query string, but it's a query string that is not tied to a technology. So <coughs> even if you change your technology, the query still works and you still get your subset. Um, so that's the spatial data on the web working group, and there's a lot going on there, um, and I would urge you to monitor it, and even better, join the group uh, and get involved in that. My next working group, this is new, this, is, this hasn't started yet, but I think it will probably start next year. 
subject to member approval and process and lots of stuff. I have to, I have to go through lots of different hoops to get there. But we're making progress on um, uh, a language to define rights and licenses and permissions and so on. Now, that is politically sensitive, talking about rights and permissions. Um, however, uh, one, one question that comes up all the time, as soon as you mention rights and license, people say, just use uh, Creative Commons. Nothing wrong with Creative Commons, it's very, very good. And if Creative Commons does the job you need it to do, please use Creative Commons and don't do anything more complex. Creative Commons is understood, it's good, it's fine. But there are cases when it isn't enough. And if you're dealing with an archive, if you're dealing with commercial images and creating commercial um, products at the end of it, if you've got uh, material that's under copyright in different places, whatever it may be, Creative Commons ain't enough. And you need to actually have a more sophisticated system that says the rights holder of this image is that person. If I put this image in a web page with something over here, what happens if I mix this data set with that data set? What comes out of it? Um, you can easily get running off into rule languages, which we're not going to do. But we might go as far as set operations, the intersection of this set of permissions and this set of restrictions is that you can do X, Y, or Z. That's a working group that I expect to start next year. If you come across this space at all, you may be familiar with something coming out of one of our community groups called ODRL. Uh, so ODRL is the starting point for this group, and we are hoping to put that through a recommendation track. It's got a lot of interest from particularly the publishing industry, who have these internal workflows. It's a business-to-business -business language more than a business-to-consumer language business to business language, how can I uh, make this, how can I make this work? So that's a new <coughs> thing, I could start very soon. <coughs> so, let me end with some uh, thoughts on blue sky thinking. <coughs> One of the questions that comes up, um, because W3C is slow, we are slow, for the reasons I said it might have the start, it's hard to get any new standard through the process. And we make an apology for it, for the reasons I said. It has to be difficult because the, you have to be able to, be, to depend on those standards. So this means that there are some little bits that don't get done. Little tiny things. So for example, the Sparkle um, standard has a few errors in it, which are all documented. We know what the errors are. Wouldn't it be nice, rather than having those errata in a separate document, if we simply merge them into the main document? Yes, it would be nice, but we don't have a working group that is empowered to do that. One of the things about our publishing system, um, which is actually just one big CBS repository, is once a document is in place, you're not allowed to touch it. You can't, you can't delete it. Um, you can edit something in place, but if it's, in, if it's a standard, you can't touch it. I'm not allowed to edit anything that has w3.org slash tr. So that, what that means is that when a standard is published, the errors have to be collected in a separate page, which makes it harder to read. So maybe we should look at those. There are other things that people are doing in this space that are getting wide usage, but they're not formal standards. So compression. There are different ways of compressing the data, because if, you know, triples are not compressed. They're very verbose. Maybe we can do something about that. There's a member submission. That is something that one of our members wrote and submitted it to us as a good idea, called HDT, which is a way to compress these triples down and do things more efficiently. Maybe that should be a standard. One of our members is very keen on graph normalization and graph signing. Um, many of you may have played with linked data fragments. Again, widespread use, but not standards. Should we have an overall kind of household group, a housework group, that picks up these little bits and puts them all through? We'd love to do that. I'd really like to do that, to clean up. The problem is, who's going to do it? It's not sexy. It's not exciting. How do you convince your boss? I want to spend half a day a week on cleaning up the stuff that we use already that doesn't need changing. That's a really hard ask to get your boss to agree to that. What else is going on outside W3C? You, um, this is a picture of the computer HAL in 2001, a space oddity. In this context, I'm talking about the hypermedia architecture language. The question you may have heard people ask is, does link data need RDF? <laughs> You can do link data without RDF. Oh, okay, how? How is an answer to that? Hypermedia architecture, by the way, there are links at the end of these slides. At the end of these slides, which are online, there's a whole lot of links to all these things, so you can follow it up. How is 
pure JSON, and the, some of the, the, the property names are typed links. And it actually gives you link data in pure JSON, which you may see as a competitor, you may see it as a future way forward. You may think, hooray, I can throw away my triple store and I'll just use JSON, who knows? But HAL is uh, it's an internet draft, it's not, a, it's not fully RFC, but a lot of people are working on that, that may be of interest to you. Something I'm looking at for next year, perhaps, is uh, what I call analysis share. We have provenance. We have a whole bunch of ways of saying what you did, but I'd like to get into sharing the results of text analysis, sharing the results of sentiment analysis, sharing the results of analysis of a set of documents or a set of data. I had these starting conditions. I ran this algorithm and this was the output, and you can challenge it or whatever it may be. What did you do? Share that in a way that makes sense. Prov is clearly 80% you know, of that answer, but there's more to it than that. Maybe we should have, I'm, I'm hoping to have a workshop on that sometime during 2016. Another issue that comes up occasionally is if you go and speak to an, ID, to an IT department in any large organization, they will show you the UML diagram of their system. And UML. It's great. I use UML. You use UML. If you're, if you're trying to design a data model, you will use UML. So it's really good that there's an ISO standard for turning UML into OWL. The problem is it's particularly ugly OWL, and it's unusable, and it's crap. Because in UML, if you have two classes with the same name, sorry, two classes with, with, with the same property, and the property has the same name, they're not the same property. UML has no way of saying that in class A, fourth name is the same over here in class B, fourth name. They, 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 they're not the same at all. So perhaps you can do something better with that. The moment, the best way to do it is to sit down and you do it, because you're better than any automated system. But if you're dealing with thousands of classes, that ain't going to work. So maybe we can do something about that. You've seen this picture before. This is the problem we face all the time. We'll do it in five. We face this problem all the time. The skepticism. The, you're a solution looking for a problem. You're a bunch of academics with no idea of the real world. Get real. Use JSON and have done with it. If it's not in the browser, I don't want to know. If it doesn't work in Excel, you're wasting my time. We face that all the time. You, and I, you, know, that, you know that, I know that. So the skepticism is very real. How can we overcome that? How can we actually if we believe in this technology, and I'm assuming that given that this is the Semantic Web Pro conference and it's the, what, the fourth or fifth in the series, I'm assuming that I'm preaching to the choir. How do we actually show that this is worth doing? What do we need? Well, one of the things that's missing is good tooling. We don't have good tools for this. People are used to using Excel. People are used to using their, their, their various tools that they have, and that's familiar and it's comfortable. And what's the equivalent? If you're a developer, you like jQuery. What's the equivalent of jQuery that understands linked data? What's, where are these frameworks that make it easy? Why don't, if you go to a hackathon, I guarantee you, a hackathon, they're not going to be writing Sparkle queries. You know that, I know that too. We have to overcome this somehow. W3C, we have problems as well. We would like to build all sorts of tools. We'd love to have a proper vocabulary management system. A system where you could be in a community group and you can log on and you can say, I want to add this new term. An obvious one to say in this forum is, I want to add a French translation of all these terms. That should be easy. It should be really easy. And the only thing that's stopping us providing you with that tool is money. It's money. We just need the money, or we need you to do it, or some sort of project. You may not be aware of this. Some of you are, I know, but many of you will not be aware. The W3C doesn't exist. There is no such thing legally. I don't work for W3C, I work for URSIN, which is a research institute in Sofia Antipolis. We are a French organization. We can take French money, European money, I don't care where the money comes from, but with the money and the skills, we can build some of these tools that you may need on our website, that you may need it, who knows? We have to overcome the skepticism. So yeah, we need better tools, not necessarily new standards, we need better tools that use the existing standards, tools that work in a way that developers like, that end users like, that feel right to them. We of course need better connections to other technologies. 
if how the hypermedia ar architecture language is the way forward to reach out to uh, the JSON crowd, great, let's do it. it. It actually, you can map how to RDF, it works. It may not be what you feel good about, but if it works and it helps you get more people in, maybe that's what we should be doing. And we need more and more examples. We need examples of companies making huge amounts of money by doing this stuff. I hope you make lots of money. I want you to make lots of money. We need to prove, because it is hard. If you, if you map your stuff to somebody else's, yeah, of course link data helps, but it only helps a bit. It's still hard. You still have to do the ontology mapping. You're still going to find there are gaps. You're still going to find edge cases where your stuff just does not fit Dublin Core. So you reinvent half a Dublin Core. That happens all the time. There's work to do. Standards are part of it. I don't think they're all of it. We're willing to work with you in any way we possibly can. This is a great technology. We had 10 years of success. We're still we're in year 11 of success. There's a lot going on that we want to do. And I hope we can do it together because it's really exciting. Links on the following slide.